So today I'll be doing a video based on a script that I actually started working on a couple of months ago. It's one that I've been saving for a week where I didn't really feel like talking about that week's uh, news in depth. Now, that's not to say that there hasn't been PC gaming hardware news this week. After all, there was the release of a new gaming CPU flagship from Intel, the i9-13900KS, that, well, that was about what I expected and what I leaked. I leaked that this thing would be about 20% more expensive than the i9-13900K a month ago, and I don't know who would have been expecting more than about a 2 to 5% performance increase. Uh, honestly, if anything, the i9-13900KS has disappointed me in its performance, but it's entirely understandable that the reason it's maybe a bit disappointing in its multi-threading performance uplift is that they can't pull the power consumption lever anymore. Basically, they just are releasing these golden samples of their i9 early that really can't use any more energy, just use a little more voltage to boost a little higher, so that the golden samples of Raptor Lake are what's compared to Zen 4 X3D next month. That's it. That's why this chip is being released. They didn't even really provide it to any reviewers. Hardware and Box had to jump through a couple of hoops to uh, be able to review it on launch day. And to me, that tells me that either Intel is just embarrassed by this product or they aren't actually making a whole lot of them or... Most likely, it's probably a bit of both. And so I really don't have much to say about the i9. It costs too much. It uses too much energy to be able to even get close to the Zen 4 X3D um, gaming chips we're going to see next month. You're going to have to buy RAM kits that cost like 300 freaking dollars. It's absolute mockery of sanity. And I don't think it's really for anyone. And it just looks desperate. Unlike the other piece of gaming hardware news that came out this week, the release of the Ryzen non-X SKUs, which are, well, they're about what I said I thought they would be a week ago in my AMD CES analysis video. I mean, what really is there to say? AMD has just made it so that Raptor Lake looks kind of silly as a consideration. If you're doing a mid-range build then for gaming, then you should get the R5 7600. It's $100 less than the i5. It comes with a cooler that is enough of a cooler for it because it uses half the energy of the i5 and it's on a better platform. It's just better. It's a better option than the i5 for gaming. If you're going for multi-threading performance, your whole build's going to probably be in the thousands of dollars then at a certain point. You know, if you want cheap multi-threading performance and that's it, then frankly, there's last-gen chips like Alder Lake or Zen 3 you should be considering. But if you're comparing Raptor Lake to Zen 4, well, AMD's doing what I thought they might do. They seem to be keeping permanent price drops on the XSKUs, leaving room for these Zen 4 X3Ds to not be that overpriced. It's not as cheap as holiday pricing, but a $600 7950X it uses substantially less energy than Raptor. Like, comes on a better platform. It's just top to bottom, it's hard for me to make a recommendation for Raptor Lake anymore unless they start dropping in price, which when I look around, they are that little bit. But I know, and I said this in previous pieces of content, that they can't drop in price that much because Intel has razor thin margins and the company is, they can't afford to have lower margins than what they have now or they'll be selling things at a loss and they're already hemorrhaging employees. So yeah, there isn't really much to say. You know, I've talked about this for a few minutes now, but that's all I have to say about the releases from this week. And so, yeah, I want to do something for RDNA 3 that I did for Lovelace last year. One of my most accurate videos predicting the performance of an upcoming product was a video that actually didn't try to use any sources. What it did is it used publicly available node information from TSMC and then die size estimates that were actually basically verified by the hack on NVIDIA. So it was practically just public information as well to say, hey, we know the die sizes of Lovelace. We we know the nodes they're probably going to use in a best case scenario, some form of like a four nanometer-ish node, which it did end up using. And based on that, what should the performance of Lovelace be ideally? Is it possible for it to hit triple the performance of Ampere? And that video concluded, no. That the people telling you that there's going to be some 1,000 watt GPU that somehow tripled or quadrupled performance over Ampere, that the math wasn't there to suggest it was even theoretically possible. However, that video also said, the people expecting Lovelace to only be like 40% better than Ampere, those people are also wrong because... 
the math is there that this thing should be at least like 60% better than last gen, and lo and behold, that's what we got. And looking at RDNA 3's performance that, at a minimum, did not hit the performance goals AMD set for themselves, I want to take a, another gut check on the red side of the fence this time and go, you know, looking at the nodes in AMD ended up using, looking at the die size of Navi 31, did AMD fail to properly utilize TSMC effectively to get to a level of performance we should have all expected. Were we all off? Should we have expected less? And well, that makes this video maybe a little less sexy to some people. You know, it's less of a prediction video, more of a post-mortem. At the end of this video, I'm actually going to use this information to suggest what we might expect out of better RDNA 3 products coming this year, and also to tease what you should expect out of maybe an RDNA 3 Plus or even a Blackwell product based on upcoming nodes and expected die sizes for those products as well. So stay tuned. That is going to be exciting. But first, before I get into the node analysis, I have to put out a disclaimer like I did near the beginning of the Lovelace video. You see... This is all only really possible to be a gut check, to be a rough look at multiple data points and go, did this succeed as well as this thing roughly? We can only do a rough estimation here because although TSMC puts out what theoretically you should be able to achieve on their nodes, basically no architecture gets there theoretically. A lot of architectures fall short, sometimes by design because they weren't trying to do anything crazy. And some architectures are massive engineering achievements that get close to what's theoretical, but that's it. And there's always a variance. There's always a kind of like an artisanal, we'll see what the engineers can achieve this time through their work. See, when engineers are designing a new architecture on a smaller node, basically what they're trying to do is find a way to take all the theoretical gains you can get in a new node and maximize them. Ideally, they get close to what TSMC says you should maximally be able to do on their new node. And if they fail, well then you just don't quite get to as good as it theoretically could have been. But you never quite get there theoretically. And so the only way to look at what we should have expected out of Navi 31 performance, which was used in the 7900 XTX, is to look at what AMD achieved with previous architectures and go, okay, that's what you should have expected to get before. That's what they achieved. Did they at least get as close to those numbers, relatively speaking, this time around? And the first data point for comparison I'm actually going to use is Vega 64 to Radeon 7. And I know Vega 64 was fully enabled, Radeon 7 had four compute units disabled, but I think that made a couple percentage points difference in gaming performance at most. And I think it's just a really interesting example. They have used basically the same amount of energy, are basically the same architecture, but one of them was using a way better node. It's an interesting example of what happens when a company doesn't try to maximize a new architecture on a new node and maximize all the little things it can do. They just are a little lazy and say, hey, we're taking this architecture. We're just going to get what we can moving to a way better node. And for this comparison, you actually have to take two steps to get to what you should have expected theoretically out of this node shrink. Because it's on TSMC's website, they compare 10 nanometer to 16 nanometer, which is what I will be using. It's the closest to uh, Global Foundry's 14 nanometer, give or take here and there. It's roughly an equivalent node. And then you have to compare the 7 nanometer enhancements over 10. So Going from 16 to 10 nanometer, you're supposed to be able to get a doubling of logic density, 15% faster clock speeds, or or 35% less power consumption. I do have to emphasize the or because, again, and I have to, just like I said in that Lovelace video and like I've had to say in many other pieces of content, these enhancement claims TSMC makes, they don't expect you to get all of these at once. You're choosing between what you can do and making a new architecture that tries to maximize well, the goals you're trying to achieve, whether that is maximum performance, minimal power consumption, or some combination, usually of both. But anyways, going then from 10 to 7 nanometer, you get a 1.6x logic density improvement, a 20% faster speed improvement, or a 40% power con. Uh, reduction. So we can actually kind of combine those theoretically. You should be able to. Remember, this is just a gut check. I know it's not perfect, but that means going from 16 to 10, 10 to 7, you should be able to get a 3.2x logic density increase in some scenarios or a 1.38 clock speed increase or a 1.89 times less power consumption. And well, AMD got a 33% reduction in die size 
and a around 20% clock speed increase. Basically, they used up about half of that clock speed lever on an existing architecture and then used the rest of it to add a few new features and reduce the die size a little bit. That's all you really get when you shrink an architecture and don't go for something entirely new. And I think this is an important data point to start with because any time a new architecture comes out and it doesn't live up to some people's expectations, there's always this camp that says, why didn't they just die shrink the previous thing? Well, because if they just die shrink the previous thing, typically they're just going to get a 20 to 40% boost and it'll be just as big as it was before or worse. So that is a good example of what happens when all you do is shrink an architecture. Although I will say that Radeon 7... It was based on an architecture not meant for gaming that brought massively higher FP64 and bandwidth performance. But it's still worth looking at nonetheless, I think. The second data point that I want to bring up will look much more impressive to you, I expect. This one, the RX 580 to the RX 6650 XT. This example here is interesting because you have roughly the same power consumption, roughly the same die sizes, and roughly the same performance segment, like lower mid-range. And I know I could have used the RX 480 to the 6600, but I thought this was better because they were both pushing it harder. And their power consumptions were closer than if I did the 480 and the 6600 XT. But anyways, let's talk about it. The expected boost, we've already said what 16 to 10 is and 10 to 7 is. So these are the same possible theoretical enhancements that I said you could get going from Vega 64 to the Radeon 7. And with the same design enhancement potential, well, what did we get? We got roughly the same die size and almost double the transistors per millimeter squared while ramping up clock speeds 1.9 seven times so amd managed to use up most of the logic density increase and get a speed increased way higher than if they just use the same architecture way higher well using same amount of power that is really really impressive and i think the final data point is probably equally impressive and unsurprisingly it's from the same architecture as the 6650 xt the 6900 XT from the 5700 XT. I have this as my third comparison point because it's interesting in that it was two different architectures that just increased die size on the exact same node. And AMD managed to over double performance. This is pretty incredible and it sounds like it shouldn't be probably to a lot of onlookers you'd say well you're using about double the amount of silicon 251 millimeter squared to 520 millimeter squared why shouldn't it at least double performance well i don't know what to tell you guys if you look at almost any generation of cards doubling die size typically doesn't double performance even within the same architecture so going to on the same node a new architecture you know, redesigning how you do so many things and actually managing to double the performance and actually over double the amount of transistors, it's pretty incredible. And it shows you really what is possible when AMD hits a home run. And I want to be clear that RDNA 2 doesn't just look impressive compared to RDNA 1 because of I don't know, RDNA 1 leaving performance on the table and really being like a 0.5 architecture that's not impressive. RDNA 1 was impressive. If I compare it to the RTX 3060, it doesn't have ray tracing, but it hits the same level of performance while being 14% less transistors. So there's really no argument here. Yes, the 3060 has ray tracing and uses a bit less energy, but it also has a bigger die. And so there we go. I've given you an example of what happens when you just try to kind of lazily die shrink an architecture between two nodes and not do much else. What do you get? I've given you an example of two cards, one of them that had a new architecture built from the ground up for the latest node compared to an old one where their power consumptions were the same, their die Die sizes were basically the same. What you can achieve if you hit a home run. I've also shown that you don't need a new node to hit a home run. Sometimes, if you really nail it, you can just make the card twice as big and actually double performance. All these comparisons. What about RDNA 3? What about Navi 31? Was it a failure? I'm going to talk about that and also what you might expect out of new RDNA 3 products coming out later and Blackwell. But first, an ad from a sponsor. 
Jessie here may know how to fetch very well, but she really hasn't learned one of the main things any viewer of Moore's Law's Dead should know by now, and that's that you don't need to overpay for Microsoft Keys. This piece of content is brought to you by CDKeyOffer.com. There's just no reason to pay exorbitant monopolistic prices for Microsoft Office or Microsoft operating systems anymore. Not when you have someone like CDKeyOffer.com, who's been a fantastic sponsor of Moore's Law is Dead for many years now. If you're looking for anything from Steam games, Origin games, you play games, or PlayStation keys, or reasonably priced Microsoft software, go to cdkeyoffer.com today, click the links in the description, and use the offer codes Broken Silicon for 25% off Microsoft keys and Die Shrink for 3% off everything else on the website. Don't be like Jesse here who's chewing on my chair right now. Be smart, don't overpay for online software, and go to cdkeyoffer.com today. All right. Let's get into the RX 7900 XTX node utilization analysis, and I will be comparing it to the 6950 XT. I could have compared it to the 6900 XT, and some people might have argued I should have, but their power consumptions are similar. You know, it's 335 watts compared to 355 watts, and their die sizes, their total silicon die sizes are actually about the same. So this is interesting, but what complicates this, and I apologize now for what I'm about to do and for what I've been doing this whole video, blowing through a bunch of math quickly. Just I double check things. You can put in the comments if you think I made a mistake, but otherwise bear with me to get to the conclusion. That's the point. This was complicated by the fact that, you know, 300 out of the 520 square millimeters of silicon were 5 nanometer. The rest was 6 nanometer. And so what I decided to do is actually something that if anything makes it so that AMD should more easily look impressive. And that's I just averaged out the performance theoretical increases you could get out of N7 to N6 and N7 to N5, just to see if AMD at least beat that. Although it needs to be kept in the back of your mind while you're listening to this, that AMD designed the portions of the architecture that can most benefit from 5 nanometer to be on 5 nanometer. And the parts of the architecture like the cache and the I.O. that wouldn't shrink as much on 5 nanometer anyways, those are on 6 nanometer. So you should expect at a minimum that they beat what I get to, but I just averaged it. So if I average the, you know, percentage of it that's 6 and the percentage of it that's 5 nanometer, you know, 220 millimeter squared were 6 nanometer, 300 millimeter squared were 5 nanometer, you should expect a 1.54 times density increase, you know, averaging the 80% potential increase from N5 and the 18% increase from N6. After that with N6, there's nothing else. I just kind of averaged it out to be no increase with some increase. And yeah, 1.54 times density increase or a 1.11 times clock speed increase or 23% power consumption savings, right? So, you know, this is a node increase overall still, even with this weird averaging I'm doing. But yeah, when I look at the comparison then, the 7900XDX, the 6950XT, I can see that we got a 2.15x density increase in transistors. So yeah, they definitely beat that. And well, there was no clock speed increase though, but we did get about a 30% power savings, which is better than the 23% power savings. And remember, you would hope AMD beat that very lazy average I did there, considering they put the parts that needed five nanometer most on five nanometer. And so, yeah. I guess what then I can conclude then, or what I will conclude, is considering we should have expected the laziest design ever to get at least a 23% power savings and at least 54% more transistors that AMD easily beat this. They did not hit the design goals they stated publicly. They did not get a 54% efficiency increase, at least at launch, but they did beat the bare minimum. And so I would say that you can't call RDNA 3 a failure Theoretically, it achieved what you pretty much should expect it to achieve. It just didn't achieve what they wanted it to. And that's especially obvious when you consider that AMD actually hasn't released full Navi 31 yet. I keep reminding people of this, and I'm going to keep doing it. Navi 31 has the capacity to stack more MCDs on top to get to a total of 192 megabytes of Infinity Cache. Right now, Navi 31 is not using more infinity cache than the previous gen flagship which is absolutely crazy and amd would have not put 
that money into designing that capability, allowing for that capability in these dies that cost money, that cost money to do that, unless they thought the compute units in the top model would require more bandwidth. And clearly what they found is at least with existing drivers, those compute units are not performing as well as they were hoping they would on average. And so they don't need the extra bandwidth and they would be better off not wasting more money on silicon. Those compute units can't even utilize well yet. And I say all of this because if AMD was able to boost the performance of Navi 31 with either driver updates or with just, I don't know, you want if you want to call it a fixed RDNA 3 Plus architecture later this year, they could add more MCDs and that would add more to the total amount of silicon. Now, it's not clear to me if there is a separate MCD that's smaller, that maybe doesn't have the memory controller, that just has the cache portion of it, or if it is literally just the same MCDs, but it seems like it might be a slightly smaller, different one. But what you would say is, if they were to stack six more things of cache onto those memory controllers around that GCD, you'd be adding 19 to 42% more silicon to the design, depending on exactly how it works, which means... Yeah, then if it was a home run architecture, you would expect its performance to be probably 20 to 40% better, which would put it pretty close to top 8102, which hasn't even come out yet, close to 4090 Ti performance. And then RDNA 3 would probably look a lot more impressive. Again, AMD would not have designed this capability to use more Infinity Cache, more silicon, meaning more performance, unless they thought it might be able to utilize it that costs money, but it can't. And that's why RDNA 3 right now isn't hitting AMD's top design goals, but still at a minimum is hitting what you would expect out of an architecture that uses this much 6 nanometer and this much 5 nanometer silicon. It isn't performing how AMD wants it to, but it isn't a failure theoretically. And in all honesty, there is still some hope, and I do not think it's just hopium or copium that AMD can get RDNA 3 to perform much closer to their stated design goals eventually. Already this week, we have seen AMD drastically improve efficiency in frame rate capped gaming and in idle power consumption for the 7900 XT and XTX. So there you go. Already this has been out not even a month and they have had that type of an improvement getting closer and closer to what they said RDNA 3 would perform like. I believe that over the next few months, we are going to find out if the Radeon driver team can get this thing to not double RDNA 2 performance yet because it's not even using the full configuration, but at least get the compute units performing another hopefully 10 to 20% better relative to the 4090 so that it's like, you know, only 5 to 10% behind the 4090 instead of like 15 to 25% behind. But AMD needs to do that first before they consider releasing any new flagship with the full die with the full set of MCDs. They need to know where they stand. How much of this design can be fixed just with drivers and how much of it might need an RDNA 3 plus. Then they can decide if it's worth launching the full Infinity Cache model now or if they would be better off just trying to release some sort of RDNA 3 plus later this year, which on that note, then I just want to say this for fun here at the end. Theoretically, not me promising you, <laughs> theoretically, if there is some version of this thing that could be improved to the point that you just release an RDNA 3 plus that uses like the same MCDs and all of them, you know, the six for the memory controllers and then stacks the cache on top. Maybe they even use the TSMC N4P node. I would say theoretically, there's definitely room here for a new generation at the end of this year that's 40% better at least, maybe even 50%. You know, you're talking about adding another 20 to 40% silicon, assuming that's able to utilize the fixed version of RDNA 3, RDNA 3 Plus. And then if they move that to N4P, add another like 10% on top of that at least. So yeah, I, I think there is room for AMD to launch something quite a bit better later this year. Now, if they can just do that with a driver enhancement and then using the full Navi 31, that would be ideal for AMD. But if they require a updated design, well, that's what they could do if they really pushed it. And uh, yeah. Speaking of pushing it, one thing I also want to touch on in this video before I let you guys go is theoretically, 
because I'm sure already the fake leakers are just farting out fake stuff now, just like they did multi-tile Phoenix and, you know, Zen 3 Plus on desktop and all of this horse shit that lot, too many websites are talking about over and over, no matter how many things they get wrong. I want to get ahead of what you can expect out of Blackwell performance. So what I've heard, you know, and this isn't people doubling down yet with me, but what I've heard from some people, you know, that work with NVIDIA is, yeah, you can expect Blackwell to have a huge die and probably be on the latest node. It's really like the least surprising thing anyone can say. But let's just assume that then. Like, it doesn't matter if it comes from a source or not. Let's assume NVIDIA goes to the reticle limit, you know, so about 858 millimeters squared. Although in practice, it'd probably have to be a bit smaller than that. But screw it. It's theoretical. Let's just say they can go to 858 millimeters squared. And then let's also assume they're actually on, like, the N3 node, you know, which is much less of an enhancement, by the way, going from the five nanometer family to the three nanometer family than going from Samsung's eight to a custom five nanometer node, which is what they did going from Ampere to Lovelace. And well, that got NVIDIA about a 90% performance increase, right? And it is 90% because they haven't even released full Lovelace yet. Right now they're like 65% better than a 3090 Ti. They could add another at least 10% on top of that. You know, that was impressive. If you take a node that's a node increase that's way less impressive though. But then you also give NVIDIA a die size that's like 40% better or something. If they absolutely hit a home run, I think you could expect NVIDIA to increase performance about double again, but that's at most. Now, this of course assumes that NVIDIA stays monolithic with Blackwell, which for now it seems like they're probably going to. But it also assumes they don't do anything else crazy. And I do want to throw one wild card in there, though. I don't think it's entirely insane to suggest from some recent talks I've had with people, not at these companies, but at the foundries that make these products, that there are some new types of stacked cash that might act as somewhat of a game changer for Blackwell, right? I'm not suggesting Blackwell, at least I can't suggest yet, that they'll use multiple types of chiplets in the same way that like RDNA 3 does. But I would not be surprised if Blackwell had a mass of like 800 millimeter square die, and then on top of that or behind it or on some other part of the PCB, there was a layer of cash attached to that die that was the same mass of size. If they did that, if they added hundreds of megabytes or actually gigabytes of cash that's almost effectively like having an MCM design in terms of the boost you might get. You could put all of your transistors that are needed for like logic on one die and put all of the cash on a stack die. And that way you effectively get the benefits of having a bigger die size without needing as many of the tricks of communicating between all these different IP blocks. It would just be going through a layer of cash and, I actually do think that's possible. If that happened, then yeah, I could see something that's at least double the performance of Lovelace, but I would find it very hard to believe that it's like quadruple or triple or something like that. Maybe in ray tracing, I don't know, but certainly not in raster. And just keep in mind, though, if that happens, that means they're basically tripling, quadrupling the cost of the silicon to get to two times or more performance. And that means that the R the RTX 5090, if that's what it's called, that means that thing would easily cost two grand and probably cost three grand or more. So just just be careful what you wish for. But I can't count out that NVIDIA doesn't have some way of using more silicon without going as radically MCM as AMD is right now. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it for this video. The end of this video, what I'm talking about with stacked layers of cash from new technologies from foundries, this is kind of a teaser for some upcoming stuff that I'm hoping to leak later this year. You're going to want to make sure you're subscribed to the Moore's Law is Dead YouTube channel and that you've rang the bell button so you don't miss those upcoming bombshells I will be dropping from this channel. And 
from what I've seen, YouTube says about half of you aren't subscribed. So double check that you're subscribed. You know, tell your friends about us. Give us a like. And if you have the extra money, consider supporting Moore's Law is Dead on Patreon. The patrons are paying for me, Dan, Gerard, Sean Philippe, and a growing list of Moore's Law is Dead, you know, team members to put food on the table. And if you support us on Patreon for just like $2 a month, you get exclusive podcasts like Dive Stream. You get access to the Discord. Higher tiers get access to Broken Silk on early and ad free. You can ask me questions, ask us questions. Questions, ask free questions on loose ends. There's so much content out there for free, and it comes out early if you support us on Patreon. But otherwise, no matter what, thank you for watching.